The hearing on the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor and Pensions will come to order. I note that a quorum is present and without objection, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. Mr. Hart Hartagensis, uh, as you near the end of your five year term as the director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation or PBGC, the day has come for finally come for appropriate oversight and accountability. Uh, the 31 million Americans with private pensions plans deserve to hear from the top government official responsible for safeguarding their retirement. The PBGC was created to be the insurance company uh, for private pension plans. If the employer is unable to pay out the benefits by the time a worker retires, that worker should have confidence that he or she will still receive their benefits because of the PBGC's protection. Under the law, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation was created to be self-sustaining meaning that it should operate under Congress's oversight, but independent of taxpayer funds. The pension insurance and PBGC operations are supposed to be funded primarily through employer premiums, not covered by the U.S. Treasury. However, this all changed under the Biden administration. The so-called American Rescue Plan Act gave a $91 billion bailout to the failing multi-employer pension fund. The need for the bailout underscores the ongoing mismanagement of funds at the PBGC. Mr. Hartagensis, uh, your time at PBGC has been marked by waste, fraud, and neglect. In dispersing funds made available to you by the American Rescue Plan, PBGC sent almost $127 million to fund pensions for nearly 3,500 dead people. This happened under your watch, despite the Office of Inspector General's warning to cross-check these payments with the Social Security Administration's death master file. Then you refused to claw back or collect those funds. In January and February, Chairman Fox and I sent you letters detailing the committee's concerns and seeking answers from PBGC. Unfortunately, the responses we received from your agency were inadequate and failed to provide clear answers. So I hope you'll take the opportunity today to be more forthcoming and come clean about PBGC's implementation of the American Rescue Plan and its inexcusable payments to multi-employer pension plans for dead people. Uh, I think we can all agree, and it should come as no surprise, that dead people don't need pension checks. Additionally, the PBGC has also looted the Treasury of over $4.6 billion by intentionally lowering interest rate data below the statutory limit. This willful misuse of data is another affront to taxpayers and goes against the PBGC's initial evaluation of the calculation, which stated that, quote, PBGC does not have the authority to provide a different rate or bifurcate the statutorily mandated interest rate, end quote. Finally, while PBGC has loosely handled taxpayer dollars by bailing out failed multi-employer pension plans, it's given no such relief to businesses with solvent plans. Singer employer programs have consistently paid high insurance premiums and consistently avoided insolvency. The single employer pension surplus is $44.6 billion. So I think it's time to come to the table with policymakers and legislators to reward these plans for their good stewardship by lowering premiums. For many to achieve the American dream of a comfortable and secure retirement, they need to rely on personal savings, Social Security, and a pension. Sadly, the government today poses a threat to all three. Biden inflation is devaluing personal savings. Social Security faces a 23% benefit cut if Congress doesn't act to make it solvent. And the security of pension programs is the mercy of bureaucrats like those at PBGC. Retirement security is quickly eroding, thanks to bureaucrats like yourself. We must hold these retirement promises made to the 31 million Americans with pension plans without sacrificing the promises made to the other 310 million Americans. Today, that means embracing accountability and oversight. And with that, I yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I s totally agree with oversight, um, but from a completely different perspective, may not be surprising. Uh, Thank you, Director. Thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for being here today, and thank you for the job you've done under extremely difficult circumstances. When President Biden came into office, he inherited a multi-employer pension system on the brink of collapse. Many plans were failing, and some, like central states, were projected to run out of money in the next few years. More than one million folks who spent their careers working in trucking, construction and other back-breaking industries were at risk of losing nearly everything they worked so hard to save for their families and for themselves. At the same time, PBGC insurance program backstopping these plans was heading towards insolvency in 2026. That was before you became director. If plans failed 
and the PBGC backstop wasn't there, these retirees would have, as the director has said in his written testimony, received pennies on the dollar. But it wasn't just retirees who were threatened by this crisis. Active workers were contributing to failing plans with any real help for their retirement and without the commensurate benefit once they retired. And due to the underlying pension rules, employers in failing plans were having trouble getting access to credit and having their credit worthiness questioned, threatening their businesses and their employees and their retirees. And let's be clear, if the multi-employer pension crisis went unaddressed, it would not have been just workers, retirees, and employers who would have been harmed. Taxpayers were also on the hook. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce was, was among those to note that the downstream impact of plans failing and the multi-employer pension system collapsing would be an increased reliance on social programs and declining tax revenue. According to one estimate, it would cost the federal government at least $170 billion over 10 years in locks, just in lost tax revenue and increased spending on social programs if you had done nothing and stayed with the status quo. The picture was bleak and rapidly getting worse. Fortunately, President Biden and congressional Democrats made it a priority to solve the multi-employer pension crisis as quickly as we could and in a financially responsible way. The American Rescue Plan Act established a special financial assistance program that provided sufficient assistance to failing plans to fully protect participa participants and our economy. It earned pensions benefits. The SFA program was widely supported by a very diverse coalition of stakeholders, including the AFL-CIO, ARP, UPS, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. How often does the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO come together to work on problem solving that was successful because of that broad coalition? It also included scores of employers business people, small and large. They wanted to do what they were required to do and also be able to attract and retain good employees with reasonable retirement benefits. To date, the SFA program has saved over 775,000 pensions and protected 3,000 American businesses, and it is still going. Unfortunately, although impacted workers, retirees, and employers reside in states represented by both political parties, not one congressional Republican voted in favor of the American Rescue Plan, and some of my colleagues continue to disparage the SFA program. Accountability, yes. PBGC deserves credit for effectively and expeditiously implementing the SFA program and be responsive to issues raised by its Office of Inspector General regarding the program's operation. One such issue, which I suspect we will hear today, we've already heard from it, about it, from my Republican colleagues, pertains to the increased SFA amount of $127 million that central states received. First, as the director notes in his testimony, in his written testimony, the PBGC did not make any payments to decrease deceased individuals. Let me repeat that. The PBGC did not make any payments to deceased individuals, and no Inspector General report has alleged that it has. Second, I understand that PBGC has addressed this issue on a going forward basis and is working with plans that received SFA to see if anything needs to be fixed retroactively and obviously prospectively. Third, in respect to the central is states issues specifically, the Biden administration's announcement from last week should pave the way for the $127 million to be returned to the U.S. Treasury. That $127 million will be returned to the U.S. Treasury. I join with Ranking Member Scott in applauding the Biden administration's announcement and their continued responsible stewardship of the SFA program. With the Special Financial Assistance Program, President Biden and congressional Democrats delivered a historic solution to an urgent crisis for American workers, retirees, employers, taxpayers, and business owners. I want to thank the director and the hardworking folks 
at the PBGC for their efforts to implement administrative, administrate the SFA program. I want to congratulate you for your dedication to solving this difficult problem, and I look forward to a productive discussion and yield back. Thank you to our ranking member. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. 14 days after the date of this hearing, which is April 3rd, 2024. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous materials referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. I'll now turn to the introduction of our distinguished witness. Today we have with us the Honorable Gordon Hartigenis, who is the Director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, or PBGC, which is located here in Washington, D.C. We thank the witness for being here today, and we look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to committee rules, I would ask that you limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement, and I'd like to remind the witness uh, to be aware of his responsibility to provide accurate information to the committee, and I recognize Director Hartigenis for fi five minutes. Can you hear me now? There we go. Thank you, Chairman Good, Ranking Member Desanye, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the important work of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation to protect millions of workers and retirees in multi-employer pension plans who face significant cuts to their retirement benefits. Before enactment of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, our multi-employer insurance program covering 11 million workers and retirees was facing a solvency crisis. The failures of numerous and larger multi-employer plans were imminent, and those failed plans would have turned to PBGC for financial assistance. PBGC's multi-employer insurance program had a small asset base and little premium income. Those plan insolvencies would have exhausted the assets of our insurance program in 2026, leaving retirees in failed plans with only pennies on the dollar. Before ARP, workers and retirees in more than 200 severely underfunded multi-employer plans faced the loss of the pension benefits they earned and needed to support them and their families in retirement. They live and work all across the country in industries that include transportation, manufacturing, printing, services, construction, fishing, and hospitality. These plans head, are headquartered in 31 states, including Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, Texas, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, Florida, and Tennessee. The risk of widespread plan insolvencies and steep increases in pension costs threaten the viability of many of the tens of thousands of companies that participate in multi-employer plans, most of which are small businesses. And the economic shocks resulting from the pandemic made the crisis even more acute. Implementation of SFA is PBGC's highest priority. Working closely with our board agencies, we moved expeditiously and responsibly to implement this unprecedented program. PBGC is committed to effective stewardship of taxpayer funds and has identified and implemented ongoing improvements to the SFA program to further that goal. It's important to note that under this program, PBGC does not make any payments to individuals, living or deceased. Furthermore, there's no evidence that any of the applicant plans intentionally misled PBGC. PBGC has addressed OIG's recommendations and we're resolving the issue of inaccurate participant census data in SFA applications. PBGC strongly supports repayment of any SFA amount that was paid based on inaccurate census data. In November 2023, we took steps to remove deceased participants from the census data of current and future SFA applications by expanding census data requirements for all plans applying for SFA and by, by matching this data against the Social Security Administration's full file of death information. PBGC is now conducting full census data audits using the SSA's full death file for plans that previously received SFA. This process requires that plans verify the SSA death record matches and determine how many beneficiaries or deceased participants should be reflected in the calculation of the amount of SFA to which the plan is entitled. Working with our executive branch partners, we're implementing a repayment mechanism for any SFA amounts 
that were paid based on inaccurate census data. Central States is currently working cooperatively with the Department of Justice Civil Division to agree on the terms and conditions of repayment of the $127 million and are optimistic that repayment will be complete in the very near term. As a result of the ARP's Special Financial Assistance Program, PBGC is providing crucial financial relief to struggling multi-employer pension plans, ensuring that millions of America's workers, retirees, and their families received their hard-earned pensions. To date, PBGC has approved approximately $53.6 billion in SFA to 71 plans that cover around 776,000 workers, retirees, and beneficiaries. And we're prepared for the work ahead to complete the application and approval process for the remaining eligible plans. The SFA program has turned around the crisis that threatened the retirement security of millions of workers and retirees. Now through this program, the workers, retirees, and beneficiaries of SFA, SFA eligible plans can rely on receiving their pension benefits far into the future. This concludes my remarks. Thank you again, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, under committee uh, rule nine, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I'll wait to ask my questions at the end, and then I will therefore recognize Mr. Wahlberg from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hardigensis, for, for being here. Um, it gives us a chance to uh, seek for the truth, find answers, mm -hmm. because uh, I'm hearing things that I, I don't perceive to be as, as accurate to, to my understanding. Um, coming from Michigan and having met with countless a uh, number of central states pensioners, as well as uh, employers, I understand the real world consequences that would have taken place had the, the fund gone under. Uh, however, we in Congress are charged uh, with being responsible stewards of taxpayer money, and taxpayers who did not participate in the pension uh, have now been asked to take care of footing the bill to prop it up. So learning that the PBGC issued central states $127 million overpayment based on data that included dead participants, data that the PBGC did not double check, I would consider that negligence. So let me ask you this question. On, on February 9th, PBGC said that it could not recover its special financial assistance overpayments, yet on March 14th, the Department of Labor posted a statement that says plans must repay overpayments made based on dead participants on the multi-employer plan census rolls. Could you please explain why PBGC's response differs from DOL's statement, and what is the PBGC's current stance on whether it will cover the $127 million? Um, okay, I'll, I'll start with the second question first. Our current stance is that we are committed to recovering the $127 million as well as any other money that was paid to any other plan for the, you know, for this, for the same reason. And stepping back a bit, um, when we, you know, back in 2021, when we were charged with implementing the SFA program, we, we, we went through a process where we had 100, the law gave us 120 days to, to listen to stakeholders, to, to, to come up with ideas of standing up the program, write the, regula write the regulations, come up, w get those regulations through you know, board and OMB approval, and then get, get the program going. So it was, the, the program was, was designed to get up, get up and running very quickly because we, you know, we were in the middle of a multi-employer crisis. There were many plans that had gone insolvent. People had taken, participants had taken benefit cuts. Um, there were plans that it, where the participants had, had taken steep cuts under MEPRA. We're certainly aware of that. that those and facts. so we, you know, as we we went to stand up the program, we we looked at how to, you know, what data could we use to to cross check in, in that data, and and it made the most sense at the time to look at government data that you know the 5,500 premium filings that had been reported to us before the enactment of ARP. The idea is to, to make sure that 
they, you know, they, we're, we're looking at data that can't be changed after, after the enactment. We then, we stood up the, the program. The, at, at the time, the, the, the complexity of using the Social Security Death Master file is that plans themselves did not have access to that data. So fast forward, when our, when our IG asked us to, to, to use the, the Social Security Death Master file, um, you know, to, you know, to, 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 you know, basically cross-check the information. We, we agreed to do that. We, we ran into a, and, and we fixed the problem going forward. We ran into a legal snag in terms of going backwards. And the legal snag was, you know, our Office of General Counsel in concurrence but, but with But they've our, told our, you, you've been told now to pay it back. What's that? You've been told now to pay so, it back. Yes, so have we- you, Have you started discussions with the uh, central states about how they're going to return the taxpayer money. That's, that's my key question. So we, 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 the legal snag that we ran into was that our Office of General Counsel said that we, we could not directly ourselves recoup that money, the $127 million. So what we did is we, we, we worked, we reached out to executive branch partners, you know, the, the Department of Justice, Department of Labor, and worked with them to find a, a, a collaborative solution where we could, in fact, recoup the money. Well, is, so, is, is what I understand now, and I'm, I have eight seconds, but so far you've approved $53.6 in special financial assistance. Yes. What are you doing to ensure the same error was not also made with respect to the other payments that were previous? Because it doesn't look like we're, we're learning from it. So we're still expending. <laughs> What what we have what we've done is so for the the the, the payments that have gone before, um, f what we've done is at at this point we've actually reached out to all the plans. So so in total, 67 plans have been been paid special financial assistance before we started doing a full death master file sc scrub, if you will. So of those one of those is central states. There's 66 others. Mr. Chair, I know my time is over, and um, we'll look for further background information on it because okay. this just isn't cutting it. Uh, the answer is here, and to saying that we didn't pay out to dead people, and now seeing that we're going forward and still doing it is a concern. We need thank more you. answers. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. I'll now recognize Mr. Courtney from Connecticut for five minutes. Uh, thank you. You can't hear me? Okay. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Mr. Courtney. No problem. Well, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairwoman, for uh, getting the audio where it should be, and, uh, and to our witness for being here today. Um, you know, when we talk about what's not cutting it, uh, this committee actually going back really to the 20 teens has been the place where the multi-employer pension crisis has been playing out year in and year out. And I think it's important for uh, the record to reflect that in 2014, there was an attempt and it was well-intentioned, the multi-employer pension assistance bill was mm -hmm. enacted uh, to try and give the multi-employers what was hoped for, uh, flexibility to try and uh, rescue their uh, financial um, crisis. And yes. You know, as your chart on page two of your testimony pretty um, powerfully demonstrates, is that it really wasn't cutting it. I mean, the, the, these plans were still sort of cascading in a neg negative direction. And the authorities that were given in that 2014 law, which basically allowed plans to cut benefits to, to retirees, I mean, that actually was, you know, where the, you know, the burden uh, hit was, was actually retired workers who, you know, had paid in faithfully to their pensions, had negotiated in good faith um, over the years, giving up wage increases, et cetera. So, you know, clearly uh, with COVID, as, as your chart shows, I mean, we, we had to act or these plans just would have gone belly up. I mean, your, your testimony is, is that if we had done nothing, uh, it would have been 2026 before we would see sort of um, large numbers of bankruptcy. Is that correct? That's correct. 2026 was the projected insolvency of the, the PBGC based on large insolvencies at, you know, central states and other plans. And which would have affected single employer plans as well as multi-employer plans. I mean, you just would have been out of Well, it wouldn't have. The, the two programs are, are separate. legally separate. That's right. Thank you. Okay. That's good to, to get that clarification. So um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who came forward to support 
the ARPA bill and, and this program, they, they actually took a look at the question of taxpayer impact. And their estimate was is that if, um, again, the catastrophe had happened and, and the multi-employer plans would have been basically, um, you know, bankrupt, that the, the impact in terms of taxpayers would be $170 billion. Uh, and that was a conservative estimate in terms mm -hmm. of just payments for social assistance programs. Isn't that correct? Yes. So, and again, so if you evaluate what the choice was before Congress and, and you know, your agency, um, the fact is, is that the ARPA was the more cost-effective solution in terms of rescuing these plans and not putting the hardship on retirees. Isn't that also correct? Well, I, th I think it's, it's a combination of the, the stress on social safety net, the social safety net, but then the, the, the human toll of, of people losing their pensions and then bankruptcies by, by employers. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of collateral damage would have happened. And, um, you know, I know um, ranking member reiterated twice in his opening remarks that no payments were made to estates of deceased retirees directly from your agency and in fact the money is still being is still held within the central states plan isn't that correct yes it is so this is not a situation where um you know sometimes social security overpays uh, a, a you know recipient at a time of death maybe a month or two where they have to claw it back i mean this is a, this is really um a negotiation that's happening between the federal government and the central state plans in terms of uh, recoupment is is that yes it, it is that that 127 million dollars is in a you know lockbox but so to speak and we are currently negotiating with them over the return and again it's really just a question of who's got the lines of authority and on the federal government side so it's the department of justice and the department of labor that are the primary entities that are engaged in that recoupment process. yes they are right now and main, the lead is the Department of Justice at this point. And again, you, you totally cooperated with the uh, Inspector General's office once they flagged or you know, identified this issue or maybe with your assistance identified this issue. I mean, this has not been a contested um, process. No, not at all. We, we, we co cooperated immediately and we, we, uh, we fixed the problem going forward as quickly as possible because that, that was the priority because to, to kind of stem the problem as, as quickly as possible. And well, then worked with, with our executive branch partners on recovery going backward, which was more complicated. So, I mean, based on what your data shows, um, you know, this has been a win-win for the taxpayer, it's been a win-win for the retiree, and it's been a win-win for the employers. And again, despite the best efforts that Congress made in 2014, which was not working, you know, this really ended up, again, rescuing the, you know, financial security of hundreds of thousands of Americans and their families um, and, and protected this program in terms of the, its future existence without a yield back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Now recognize Chairman Fox for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm really deeply disappointed that it took dogged work from Chairman Good and me to get you in the Department of Labor to see reason and to recover the federal payments for dead people. It's outrageous that this took any time whatsoever and that PBGC did not immediately own up to its mistake and recover taxpayer funds. In your comments, you talked about getting the money out to the pension people and you talk about their being taxpayers, but this money is coming from other taxpayers who, who don't have the benefit in many cases of having a pension. And yet you're worried about that. Um, you, I support what uh, my colleague from Michigan was talking about. You say you've paid out the 62 plans. Did you follow the rules on those other 62 plans that were in place that you failed to follow on the central states? Or are you going to get the money back that's been improperly paid there? Probably. We, we are going to get the, the money back on all of them. Okay. That's, that's, well, well, my question is, why didn't you follow the plan to begin with? You had rules on what you were supposed to do, and you ignored them. Are you, you, you speaking about the, the, the 2018 OIG report? Well, yes. You, the the um, 
you you didn't um, follow what the rule was for how to do this for looking at the death rolls. Why didn't you do that? And what was your interpretation that allowed you to ignore that? So we, for, first of all, standing up this program in 2021 was an unprecedented program. And when, when we looked at it, there, there was a recommendation and from our uh, IG to use the Social Security Death Master file in our regular financial assistance programs. Those are direct payments to beneficiaries. This, this program was not as easy to use that because the plans themselves don't have access to that file. So for us to require them to use it, they, they couldn't do it. And if we cross-checked with that, they would, have, they, they would have all failed because we would have found dead people they didn't find. When our IG recommended that we do it, we, we said, okay, we, we will work and make this, this program better. We, as an improvement, what we had to do was we had to, to get their census data ahead of time, have a pre-application process. But you were supposed it. to do that at the beginning. My understanding was that you were supposed to do that before you turned out the money. Uh, I understand you've said census data is just one of the multiple factors that contributed to the imprecision of assumptions. So participant roles in census data for multi-employer pension plans are facts, not assumptions. So I'm asking you, what authority did you have for the novel interpretation that payments for dead people were actuarial assumptions? Well, there, there, was, no, there was no blueprint for standing up this program. In, in fact, we, we we used the data that we had. Our IG didn't recommend that we cross-check with the Social Security Death Master file until March of 2023, so almost two years into the running of the program. And it was recommended as an improvement to the program. And we, we agreed and we said we will improve the program. And we you know, made efforts to agree with the recommendations from the IG going forward. And then looking backward, it was, it was more complicated to retroactively fix this and, and audit the plans and recover the money. Well, in your opening statement, it sounded like a lot of excuses for what has happened with the PBGC. And thankfully, the IG was on top of this and found $127 million that belonged to the taxpayers of this country, not just the people that were getting it. and. Uh, we want the PBGC to do what it's supposed to do and follow the rules in the future. And we want you to go back to these other plans, which you indicated earlier, um, that where you didn't follow the rules either. Uh, it's important. Uh, this money is important. We should not be, you, you all acted like $127 million wasn't significant. No, Do we have a commitment from you that you're going to pay attention to all of the money? Yes, absolutely. You do have a commitment, and $127 million is very significant to us. It's, it's important the reputation, to the reputation of the PBGC and the, and the program, and we intend to, to go after all the money. M Mr. Chairman, I, uh, one quick point of personal privilege, please. We have two guests in the room that I'd like to recognize. Sarah Holland, who's the principal clerk for the North Carolina Senate, and Julie Bradburn, the counsel for the Rules Committee, are here. They are visiting uh, with our um, uh, parliamentarian and attending, and I, I thank you for your indulgence. Thank, thank you Thank you, so Madam much. Chairwoman. And we'll now recognize Mr. Norcross from New Jersey for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Director, can you remind us what year you were appointed to your position? 2019. And uh, who was president at the time? <laughs> president Trump. Okay. Uh, for the record, because apparently we're missing some of this, did you make any payments to dead people? No. Any pension? No, I no. didn't think so. We're looking at 127 million. Uh, myself, uh, Ranking Member Scott, back in the 216th Congress, served on a joint commission on multi-employer pension systems, along with many others who uh, brought incredible testimony about the complexity of the multi-employer system, uh, 
a system that employed a MEPRA pr previous to that point and had looked at ways of how we could fix the system that had inherent problems. I might remind people on this committee that it multi-employer is very different than a single employer. Single mm -hmm. employer defaults, it goes under, it's pretty simple. The multi-employer system was set up so groups of employers could gather together to cover their employees. And unlike other systems, if an employer of the group would go bankrupt, the other employers picked up the unfunded balance. Let me repeat that. No government within themselves picked up when another employer went under. That's mm -hmm. a fundamental issue of a multi-employer plan and one of the complexities, but it also has saved thousands of employer plans over the years. However, there were major issues with the returns and things that went on after this. So at the end of the, uh, the joint session, there were recommendations made that were not enacted. Mm -hmm. Then came ARP and what we saw, because through no fault of their own, employees put aside their wages into a pension system that was collapsing. PBGC uh, had indicated that if things continue the way it was, then in 2026, the system would then collapse. Is that your understanding? Yes, <clears throat> it would have. Then, in fact, I think Bobby Scott actually came up with a study that close to $170 billion of direct cost to our economy would go along with that. I think that was low and that could be uh, much higher. But so there was $127 million in question whether or not it should have gone because of the use of an improper database. That has now been corrected that has now been pointed out, which is exactly what should have been done. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna get an ad boy for using the other system, but it was fixed. The money's coming back, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. In your time that serving in PBGC, have you ever had a pension, uh, a pensioner call you up and say, don't send me my check, I don't deserve it? Hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. Do you think it might happen? Probably not. I don't think so either. This is about helping ordinary Americans, the ones who want to work their lives, play by the rules, and have a little nest egg at the end. That's what we're talking about here. They want to turn this into something it's not. And that's incredibly hurtful. If you sat through the hearings that Mr. Scott and I did to hear when a person loses their pension which is their lifeline, something that they saved for their entire life. So the sense that workers in both blue and red states got pension checks, didn't they? Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to understand where the hell this hearing is going, other than the money's going to get paid back, it was identified, and we're following the rules. And the fact of the matter is there's still a lot of people out there in systems that are going to be helped by the SF. Hey, aren't they? Yes. Okay. It might sound a little rhetorical, which is what I think this hearing mm -hmm. is, a little rhetorical, instead of trying to band together to help those who are retiring that can't go back out to work necessarily. So I want to thank you for what we're doing to fix the system, what you're doing to get the money out each and every day, and most importantly, that together for pensioners whose money was saved because of what we did in Congress, I think it's incredibly important to point out, and I implore to uh, this committee to remember that. And I'd like a point of personal privilege to point out, we have Michael Scott, who testified uh, back at the NAACP, uh, the pension, and we have Jared Gabowski from NECA, who was instrumental in helping get these along, and just many people in this room helped us help those pensioners, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. We'll now recognize Ms. McBath from Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman and Ranking Member DeSonye. And thank you, Director, for being here with us as well. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to discuss one of uh, Congressional Democrats and President Biden's greatest achievements 
saving the pensions and the hardworking uh, earned retirements of over a million working families in this country. Working families that have done everything right and they've contributed to their pensions for years, they deserve the peace of mind that what they've worked so hard for is safe. Today's hearing just really gives us an opportunity to raise awareness about this incredible achievement. Um, when you spend enough time in Washington or even listening to the news, it's very, uh, sometimes it's just very disheartened to hear um, about, at times, the lack of progress, but this was different. Uh, saving the pensions of so many Americans, this was truly a great achievement. We got to ensure that over a million people that we have sworn to protect and to serve will be able to enjoy their golden years at home, and I am one of those two that looks forward to receiving a pension. I uh, will be able to receive, you know, to spend their golden years with their families in comfort and not have to worry about being forced to go back to work at the age of 70 or possibly lose the house that they raised their kids in, and that is truly not lost on me. Um, the White House and Congress we understood this urgency and the magnitude of the crisis, in particular coming through COVID-19. And we sprang into action and we passed the American Rescue Plan. Unfortunately, some of our congressional Republicans opposed this effort and failed to protect hardworking Americans and their retirement security. If this was just about union members, as some have suggested, who, let me be clear, also deserve our support and should not be wrongly vilified the way that they have been before this committee time and time again, then why do the United States Chamber of Commerce support it? You may hear differently from, from my colleagues today, but employers strongly supported these provisions of the American Rescue Plan, and we should not forget that. According to them, without federal assistance, there would have been 1.3 million Americans who would have seen their retirement benefits cut by as much as 98% within the next few years. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record two endorsement letters signed by dozens of companies, including UPS, who has a big presence in my district in Georgia and uh, throughout the entire state of Georgia. And I'm proud to represent this company and the workers who get up every single day and they move this country forward. UPS was among uh, one of the leading voices urging Congress to address the multi-employer crisis. And in 2018, they testified before us here in Congress and mentioned that UPS began contributing to multi-employer pension plans and contributes $2 billion per year to 20 seven different plans across the country. UPS understood what was at stake. And for years, they were demanding that Congress act. And I'm so grateful that we did. Director, can you talk about the importance of the American Rescue Plan Act to employers like UPS and all the other employers that have worked so hard to help uh, support their, their employees? Yes. What? Uh the, you know, the, the SFA program as, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act did was it provided stability for employers that use union labor. Those that, that contribute to multi-employer plans, um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a real risk of insolvency of these plans, which creates withdrawal liability, which creates a bill coming due, and that withdrawal liability and, and it, it creates an overhang, so it, for a lot of employers, it, it makes it harder for them to borrow money because the banks, when they're looking at making a loan to them, say, see this, this, this huge obligation that is growing and growing from, from these, is, you know, having to contribute to these insolvent plans. And so it, it becomes harder for them to get loans, and a lot of small and large businesses, um, they can't get loans when they otherwise would have been able to, and it, it creates bankruptcies in some cases. So, that, I mean, there's a lot of collateral damage from that, that was, was avoided by rescuing the multi-employer pension system. Mm -hmm. Is there anything going forward you believe that we here in Congress can do to continue to make sure that we're sufficiently supporting families and, and our workers? I, th I think there, there's, there's possibility for future reforms to the multi-employer system. The, the ARP, you know, you know the, the SFA program within ARP, was designed to 
essentially rescue the program for, th for 30 years. Um, but looking out beyond that, there are reforms that we could work on with you that, that you know, some, some things that came out of the 2018 um, Joint Select Committee and, and other efforts that could thank, make the system you. even more, more solvent. Sure. Well, the thank gentlelady's you so much. time has expired. I'd I now recognize back. Ms. Hayes from Connecticut for five minutes. Thank you. Director, were you finished with your answer to the last question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Well, my remarks are similar to many of my colleagues, so your answer would have probably answered my questions as well, because the efforts by House Democrats to save multi-employer pensions are important, and they bear repeating. And I, I actually am happy that we are holding this hearing so that the American people can really truly appreciate and understand all of the work that we did to make sure that their pensions remain solvent and that these plans that they paid into, they could expect a return on them. The challenges facing multi-employer pension systems are not new. Democrats in the House and Senate passed the American Rescue Plan, which created the Special Financial Assistance Program and provided the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation with the resources to save the multi-employer pension programs. Without the American Rescue Plan, nearly one million workers and retirees could have seen their pensions and benefits that they earned and contributed to disappear. In rescuing these failed pension plans, we saved at least $170 billion over 10 years in lost tax revenue and increased spending to care for retirees. And again, not a single Republican supported the American Rescue Plan. My question to you is how would the economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic have looked if the Special Financial Assistance Program had not been established? I, th I, th I think number one, um, you know, as I commented in my, my previous answer, there would have been more bankruptcies of, of small businesses. Um, you know, I think there would have been a lot of retirees that would have lost their pensions or, or been stuck with severe cuts. And I, th I think there would have been more um, draws on the social safety net programs. Thank you. I mean, what I try to do on this committee, a lot of our work is supporting employers, but also making sure that we are mindful of the needs of employees. You know, we have to balance our legislation to make sure that we are meeting the needs of, of everyone that we serve. The multi-employer pension crisis harmed not only retirees and businesses, but also active workers. For instance, employees in failed plans like the Central States Pension Fund were making pension contributions for active workers who would never receive a benefit equal to what they paid. And that's just unfair. A 2017 U.S. Chamber of Commerce report found workers were less likely to stay with their employer when they understood their pension would be less than expected. Director, can you explain how the multi-employer pension crisis negatively impacted workers? And additionally, how are workers today benefiting from the Special Financial Assistance Program? Well, I, th I think that you, it's obviously, it's, it's a retention problem if you are earning a pension and the you know the pension is you know 20 percent funded or th <laughs> you 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 know you get to the point where you don't believe the money is going to be there when you retire so you're less likely to stick with that company or, or stay with that that union or, or pay into that pension plan right and I, I guess i would say that the people who rely the most on their pension plans are generally people who have no other income sources or are planning mm -hmm. uh, for retirement and looking at every dollar that they've paid in. We're not talking about the wealthiest people who don't care what they're gonna collect in retirement. We're talking about the people who work every day, who pay into these pension programs, who understand at the time they're hired what their pension portfolio will look like and make mm -hmm. inve intentional investments into these programs throughout their entire careers with the expectation that they will get that money back when they retire. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we did as House Democrats to save those those pension plans and ultimately protect the retirement of American workers. With that, I yield back. Thank you. And we will now recognize uh, my friend from Virginia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Director, as I understand it, the plans were entitled to support from the uh, rescue um, fix based on the number of participants they had. Is that right? That's right. And some of those participants may have died recently, unbeknownst to the plan. 
Uh, did um, the plants have access to data to get the most recent update? And were you talking about tens of thousands of people? Did the plants have access to data uh, that could have um, revealed the number of people that have died? So the, the, the plants have access to <coughs> private sector death audits, which are not as accurate as the Social Security full death master file. And, and so they got, some got a little more than they were entitled to. <coughs> now the $170 million that's uh, frequently talked about um, what point, that was, as I understand it, was about one third of 1% of the total payment to the plan. Is that right? Yes. The central state's payment was 0.35%. Okay. Um, you have, as I understand it, fixed this by requiring all future applications to send you their list of participants that you can run through the, the Social Security system to get any recent deaths and cover this problem. Yes, we have. And you're working to get information from those plans that have already been helped to make sure that they weren't overpaid uh, by running their list through the Social Security system to get the most accurate data. Is that right? Yes, we are looking back at all of those plans. Okay, so we've fixed it prospectively and we're working retroactively to fix this problem. Yes, we are. Okay, we've heard a lot about the um, $170 uh, billion dollar, um, <clears throat> cost, not to the economy generally, but to the federal budget, uh, based on uh, decreased tax revenue and increased social safety net if we let these plans uh, fail. And that's without considering the pain suffered by people who lose their pensions, by um, uh, businesses going broke, trying to keep the plans afloat, small towns suffering by decreased uh, real estate taxes, banks suffering by people not being able to pay their loans. Uh, $170 billion in the first 10 years and a lot more after that. What was the cost of fixing the problem? It, our, our latest projection is $79.7 .7 billion. Um, less than half of the cost of doing nothing and avoiding all of that pain. Is that right? Yes. That, okay. Um, we've um, obviously been focused on the impact uh, on the pensions themselves. Uh, what impact would the failure of these plans have on businesses? The, um, as, as, like in my early remarks, they, they would have trouble getting loans. That's that the biggest problem. The, the overhang of withdrawal liability from insolvent or declining multi-employer plans would make it hard for them to, to get loans, which, which, could rec which, which would rescue them if, if these businesses got into a pinch. Because the banks would know that they have a potential liability more than they would ever be able to pay. Yes. And their loan would be behind that, so they're not credit worthy. So the businesses couldn't operate as a normal business because they can't, if they have a little short fall in cash flow, they can't borrow yes. money. That's probably um, why there was Chamber of Commerce support for the- Chamber of Commerce supported the plan. How many businesses have you saved already? I think it's, it's about 3,000 businesses that are involved with the 71 plans that were approved. And do you and, expect more businesses to be uh, saved as you go forward? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And now we'll recognize our ranking member from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director, thanks again for being here. Just to follow up on the excellent uh, five minutes by my friend from New Jersey who has a lot of experience in this field. Uh, you, were, you were nominated by the ex-Republican president for this position, correct? Mm -hmm. You were confirmed by the Republican-controlled Senate. Uh, Senator Hatch, I believe, was the chair of Committee of Jurisdiction. Is that correct? It was, yeah, that's correct. So you were confirmed by the Republican majority. This is the same time, just if memory serves me, that that same majority passed the largest tax cut for the top 1% in the history of the country, and that money is all, uh, turns out, according to CBO, has not trickled down, has not gone out into the economy. It's largely been retained by that group. That's just an editorial comment from me. Um, 
So we've talked a lot about the top line numbers. We've got lots of stories uh, to this committee and from the select committee mm -hmm. uh, testimony about individual people, individual stories. So those numbers. Um, read a couple, a truck driver in North Dakota who said, well, what am I going to do if I don't have my retirement? Uh, another freight truck driver in the Midwest who said, how am I going to get a job in my 70s or 80s driving a truck when I need to get a knee replacement? Um, I can't make my mortgage. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what's the average that is, these people are getting in pension benefits um, um, a year based on what you did and what the okay. average would be if you didn't have done what you did? Okay, so we, let's take central states, for example. The, the truck drivers, I think the, the average across the board is about $16,000 a year in terms of the, the pension benefit that they would have gotten. For long-term workers, it's close. To, it's somewhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars a year. That's that's the approximate range. Hey, let's maybe we can give you a few minutes here or moments to just. You've we've reiterated this over and over again about some of the um, accusations about mismanagement, about paying checks to deceased people. You want to add anything either on that? <clears throat> or in the, what you did as you look back on it and um, anything that's come up in this hearing that you would like to clarify further about what your actions yes. were able to accomplish given um, that you approached this, from my view, from being very, very physically responsible. Well, I, I think to, to add to your, you know, the, the comment that you said, I mean, the, this program has gone out to help, you know, people in the, the you know, fifteen to, to $30,000 a year pension range. So these are you know, hardworking folks, the, you know. I, th I think, you know, one, the one takeaway from the theme of this is, you know, number one, the SFA program, the PBGC did not make any, any payments to, to participants. So, you know, there's been some, some press that, we're, you know, the program has been used to, to pay dead people. That's not true at all. The, all the, all the, the money from this, this program has gone to plans based on a 30-year projection. We, we do understand that the, the way the program was set up, if, if we knew, you know, three years ago what we know now, we would have used the Social Security Death Master file from the get-go. It's a more accurate database. We, we did not. Um, RIG flagged it for us in 2023. We have fixed this, you know, we, we've fixed our procedures and then review process to use the Social Security Death Master file going forward. So any improvements and any approvals going forward, we'll, we'll be using that. We, you know, we, we, you know, ran it some, into some com complexities in terms of going backward and, and, you know, recovering the money, which should be recovered for the taxpayer. Um, but we believe that we've got it fixed. We've worked with the Departments of Labor and Depart Departments of Justice, and we believe we have a solution and we will be able to take care of it in the near term. And so that wonderful response to IG and you working together to correct something that was identified with no loss. Um, yes. But you inherited all that situation, correct? The, the multi-employer crisis? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, when, I, when I came in, I think my first year, the net position of the multi-employer program was about negative $65 billion. And I might add, it, it, this was something that the select committee put a lot of time into, but was a national problem. I know um, Western states, for instance, I'm a former Teamster, you know, they different the different financial situations from different parts of the country and plans are interesting to look back at, but this was all inherited in a very difficult, complex situation mm -hmm. that you fixed. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you to the ranking member. We'll now recognize Mr. Banks from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for being here today. I, I, from time to time, I hear from constituents who these days are concerned with high interest rates and what that's doing to the value of their pension plans. I, I'm wondering if you could talk about how, how can policymakers like us provide solutions and, and work with you to address some of those concerns that uh, employers and constituents have about the value of their pension plan due to high interest rates? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I think high interest rates actually have been generally a good thing for defined benefit pension plans. The way that the liabilities are measured, it, it, you know, the higher interest rates shrink the calculation of the liabilities. It makes the plans more solvent. In fact, 
you know, as of a, a very recent study, the multi-employer pension system, including, you know, the SF, SFA rescue is now about 89% funded. So it's, it's, it's improved the funding ratios and it's actually made defined benefit pension plans easier for employers to, to, to offer because they, essentially they can, they can lay off the, you know, the liabilities, you know, hedge, hedge it more easily with fixed income because they can get more return for their money. Can you talk about pension um, smoothing? What does that mean? And what's the difference between, between pension smoothing for multi-employer multi, uh, plans versus single-employer plans? So that's a, that's a good question. So the, the idea um, of pension smoothing is that, you know, as, as interest rates, kind of, they, you know, they go up, they go down. You know, if you, if you look back to, you know, between two, you know, the early 2000s to, I guess, 2021, interest rates were very low, near zero. The, the idea behind that is to, because the, you know, the way that, that calculations are done within defined benefit pension plans for, for the purposes of, of uh, you know, I guess you know, funding, like the funding rules that, that, Congress, that Congress passes on them, it, it, smoothing means you can kind of look back and average rates over a longer period of time so that the, the, the calculations that happen don't jump up and down as quickly. They're more gradual. And so they, you know, obviously when rates, rates rose more recently, the smoothing makes that rise in rates as it's, it's appreciated by pension plans more, more gradual. So what happens when rates go down? I mean, it's, it's the same thing. You're making a case it, for high it, rates, it, it but when the, rates it, go it, back it, down. It to... keeps the, the calculation of rates, you know, you know, higher for longer, and, it, and, and they, they, they fall more slowly. Okay. Interesting. Um, just last week, the DOL confirmed that the central state's pension plan must pay back the excessive funds they receive through the American Rescue Plan's special financial assistance. Have you seen any pushback from central state to pay back those funds? No, I, I, I have not, and I, I believe we've been working with our executive branch partner agencies to recover that money and, and actually think that that's going to be paid back in very short order. Why, why did the executive director of Central State's pension plan ask the DOL if it was lawful to repay PBGC under ERISA? That, that was a fiduciary concern. The idea being that they, they were concerned that if they paid back the $127 million out of plan assets, there could be, you know, lawsuits from participants saying, you know, why'd you give our money away? And the, you know, the fiduciary regulator over pension plans is the Department of Labor. So for them saying, you can do this, this is rightful, it, it removes a roadblock. So well, that was what, helpful. What is your message to American taxpayers who are concerned about having to bail out another multi-state pension plan um, on the horizon as they watch this situation of, of bailing out uh, central states? So, How do you explain that to taxpayers? The, the, are, you, are you talking about just the, the 127 million, that issue, or the, the entire program? Well, all, all the above. I mean, the, the precedent that we're setting and the, the bailout, I mean, how, how do you explain that? What, what would be your message to taxpayers why, that, why, why that's fair? I, th I think, f first of all, um, you know, in, in terms of the, just the $127 million, that we, we acknowledge that that's, you know, if we had to do it over again, we would have done it differently, and we're taking all steps to correct that, and the taxpayers have a right to expect us to do that. And, and we're going to do it. As far, as far as the entire program, I would say that this is a unique case where a, a, a series of, of things led to a, a crisis that was so great it was going to impact a large parts of the country, communities all over the place, um, you know, in, in, in many, many different states. And the, the collateral damage was going to be so large that it was going to be, be detrimental. That's why there was, uh, you know, kind of support from the Chamber of Commerce as well as from, from labor groups. I would, I would say that the main focus should be let's, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, and we now recognize Ms. Manning from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I was first elected to Congress, one of the most pressing issues facing us was the impending collapse 
of several multi-employer pension plans and the potential insolvency of the PBGC. And had the plans failed, millions of hardworking Americans would have had their financial security pulled out from under them. And thankfully, congressional Democrats took action. And I was proud to vote for the American Rescue Plan, legislation which saved pension plans in danger of collapse. Every single one of my colleagues across the aisle voted against this vital legislation. And we've heard a lot about central states from them today, but they're focusing only on one part of it. Let's talk about central states itself. We're talking about a plan with over 357,000 participants, including 11,700 in North Carolina, the mm -hmm. state where I reside, and over 1,000 participating businesses. It was projected to run out of money in 2025. So can you talk about, how central, about central states and about how important the plan is to the system, about how far it reaches? It's, it's, it's enormous. I would, I would say, you know, in, in responding to, to uh, Congressman Scott's question, you know, he asked me you know, how many employers are there. There's, you know, 3,000. I think over 1,000 of those are in central states alone. So there are a lot of employers, including UPS and, you know, a lot of different companies that use trucking services. Um, they, they would have, you know, and, and we've, we've looked at, you know, what states do the retirees reside? It's actually across the country. I mean, that, you know, those 357,000 people, they, they retire, they're all, they're all over the place. So it would have impacted communities all across the country, as well as those thousands of employers. And uh, I imagine that central states' failure was not helpful, or potential failure, looming failure, was not helpful in terms of PBGC's overall financial position. Is that right? That's an understatement. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you and your team have dealt extensively with central states over the years. Can you talk about the peace of mind that everybody must now feel now that their plan has been saved? Well, I, I would say to the, the, you know, all of the participants in the central states plan, I think they all can rest assured that they, you know, that thanks to this, the ARP program, the SFA program, they've, their, their plan is solvent at least through 2051, you know, and, and it depends on how things go and they manage things, but perhaps even further. And hopefully there'll be other people sitting in these seats dealing with that issue in 2051. <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring a broader picture to the central states discussion, and I am thankful that President Biden and congressional Democrats acted to save central states and other plans. Are there other steps that we should be considering to protect against the kind of crisis that central states experienced? There are, the way to look at it is, is that, you know, this is, this is a rescue program that takes us through the end of 2051. After that, there's, there's certain reforms that could be made that would make the system more stable. You could look at, you could look at funding, you could look at you know, the, the guarantee, you, you, know, you, you know, you could look at premiums. There are a lot of different levers that you could look at, the, you know, that, and we would be happy to work with Congress to, to come up with, with ideas that would extend the theoretically, theoretical solvency of the entire system way beyond. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Manning, and with that, I recognize myself for five minutes. I would like to take uh, a few moments uh, in, our, in our final question time here, uh, Mr. Director, to focus on the stewardship of taxpayer resources and the services that's provided to those we are obligated to serve. And of course, this should be a primary concern for every government agency and department. Mm -hmm. The White House asked all agencies to begin scaling back telework policies after they, the White House, finally recognized that the pandemic was over. I would note that my office never instituted telework policies, not in D.C., not in our district. Uh, but in the President's State of the Union address in March of 22, two years ago, he pledged that the vast majority of federal workers will once again work in person. In April of last year, OMB ended maximum telework policies and sent further instructions for agencies to develop plans to increase in-person work. Approximately how many employees do you have? We, in our head, headquarters, we've got about 
1,000 federal employees and about 800 contractors. Okay, those 1,000 uh, federal employees, how many, or what how many of those employees or what percentage would you say have agreements to work remotely? I would say the, the vast majority of them do. So do, out of 1,000, you, you would estimate actually, how many are working let me, remotely? Let me correct that. Rem remotely is it's completely right. You know, I thought you meant telework. Remotely, it's a, it's a small percentage. All right, telework. Telework, it's, it's the, the majority of them. Why would they work telework instead of coming in the office? Why would they want telework? Why, why, would, they, why would we have them do that? Why, aren't that? why are they not coming to the office? I th well, I, th I think during, during the, the pandemic, we went through a, a couple of years where... And that, that's you know, been gone for a few years. So why would they be uh, teleworking today? So we, you know, at n number one reason is in, in last year, in 2023, we actually moved our headquarters. So we moved into more expensive real estate on, at 1200 K Street to less expensive. And as we've moved in, we've settled into a new building, there have been some growing pains in the new building and, it, and having flexibility has allowed us to get some of the kinks out of- right. out, So out of a thousand employees, you would say, Virtually all of them, or almost all of them, or what number of telework versus coming to the office every day? Well, all of them come into the, uh, virtually all of them come into the office sometime. What does that mean, sometime? Meaning, you know, they, they, diff they have different telework agreements. Some of them come in four days a week, some of them three days a week. How many would you say come in four days a week out of a thousand? Is that, is that true, that a significant number come in four days a week instead of five? I would say that that's a small percentage. Okay, so what percentage come in maybe just one day a week or not at all? I would say, you know, one, you know probably a, a larger percentage are coming in. Okay, so we still have most work. employees not coming in to work in the, physically in the office. How about yourself? How often do you come into the office to work physically in the office? I'm in the office on, on average every other week. I'm sorry? Like, so I guess, you know, five days out of every 10. So half the time you're half the in, time. in the work. Office of the Advocates annual report gives a concerning review of the customer service you provide or don't provide to plan sponsors. The report says plan sponsor complaints consistently involve repeat longstanding issues such as case review delays, the absence of oversight and management, communication lapses, departmental coordination issues, and overall lack of transparency by the agency's processes and procedures. Could this be at all related to telework policies, which are no longer justified, certainly from a virus standpoint? I, th I think you have, you have to look at where the, the, the plan sponsor's advocate is coming from. This is our interaction with, with, with plan sponsors during events like bankruptcies or, or distress terminations. And these, these are times when they, they're looking for the PBGC to assume the liabilities uh, of an I'm unfunded pension plan. I'm going to interrupt you for a second and claim the time just because we've only got a minute left. But to okay. suggest that we wouldn't do a better job of servicing those we are... Uh, responsible to serve without having our whole team come into work every day, I think is, is questionable. L last thing I just want to ask you, Open Books reported uh, back in October that during your time at PBGC, you spent $14 million on new furniture for 1,000 employees, which is $14,000 per employee. $14 million for new furniture for 1,000 employees, most of which who don't come to work physically anyway. So they don't need furniture at the office, presumably. That's $14,000 for employee. I mean, $1,400 for employee might be understandable if they're all coming to work, but $14,000 for employee. Can this expense be justified? So that, that number is a little bit misleading. We, so at our headquarters, we've got, as I said, 1,000 employees and 800 contractors. So if you divide by 800 instead of, instead of 1,000, or 1,800 instead of 1,000. Well, make it like $8,000 It's, $8, it's actually, clo the, the number is closer to 7,400. Per employee, which Most is of whom less, don't come into the office. less than the the average government baseline, you know, benchmark is around nine thousand. So we are below the benchmark. And I, I want to make one other point is that that furniture purchase was not a redecoration. We moved. We actually moved from an old headquarters to a new headquarters, and in that move, we saved three million dollars a year in rent which over a 15 year oh, lease is $45 million. Dollars. My time's expired, so I'd respect to the committee. I need to go ahead and, and thank you for your comments. And now we'll go to our ranking member for his closing remarks. Thank Sorry. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you again, Director, and to all your staff for an excellent, excellent presentation today and a great job. And just if anybody's watching, if they're wondering Director's background, um, 
no one would accuse you of being a socialist if I, as I have been accused <laughs> of being a socialist. Uh, in addition to who nominated you and who confirmed you, you got a bachelor's degree from Stanford in computer science. You got a master's degree in uh, technology and management from Columbia University, and you went out and started uh, businesses in the tech field. So if anyone's watching, that's who the director is. Um, and I appreciate your problem solving, your intellect, and your honesty here today. Uh, it shows that we can get things done um, when we have divergent um, party affiliations and ideology if we work to the common good of what, how do we solve difficult problems. And obviously, in a difficult situation, remind people that this is the recent, the last four years, we're all part of an international pandemic, and you went in in this instance and solved something with the Biden administration with us that was lacking a solution prior to an international pandemic. And lastly, just on the, the conversations with real people. I mean, we tend to forget about this here in Washington, the real people who would have suffered um, if you hadn't done what you did. We've talked about that. President Biden and congressional Dem Democrats recognize the urgency and magnitude of the multi-employer pension crisis and took, as I said, historic action in the American Rescue Plan Act to solve it. Even though many of their constituents would be harmed if plans failed and the system collapsed, not a single Republican colleague voted for that legislation. The Pen Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation quickly and effectively implemented the Special Financial Assistance Program and took steps to improve its administration. So far, the PBGC has approved SFA applications from 71 plans, saving over 770,000 pensions and protecting 3,000 businesses to date. And there's more to come. And as I've said multiple times today, there are real people, real Americans, behind the pensions we saved. Kenneth Lee Edmondson wrote to the Joint Select Committee on Solvency of Multi-Employer Pension Plans that, quote, for Mr. Edmondson, the loss of my pension would force my wife and I to sell our house. Along with this, this expense and our medical bills over and above what our health insurance covers, I have to take medications to prevent a stroke from a blood clot and also medication to control heart rhythm. I worked many, I worked many long hours for 32 years and drove in all types of weather and road conditions, sacrificing time away from my family, thinking it would be worth it because of the pension income I would receive on my retirement. If I, lose, if I lost my pension, it would be devastating, just trying to survive extremely conservatively would be, would be impossible. Are we going to put, that's the end of, are we going to put, be put in a situation deciding between groceries and medications? We are innocent victims of all this. We just want what we earned, end quote. So again, I want to thank you all. You're not bureaucrats, you're public servants. I'm grateful for your service. And thank you for what you accomplished. I yield back. Thank you to the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Hartigenis, uh, thank you. I uh, recognize myself for closing remarks. Thanks for taking the time again to appear before the committee and answer our questions. Uh, unfortunately, I remain convinced that the PBGC is the poster child for bureaucratic incompetence and gross mismanagement of taxpayer dollars. It's clear that PBGC needs to crack down on the way it administers the Special Financial Assistance Fund to ensure that there aren't any other million-dollar mishaps or billion-dollar interest rate blunders. Ten years ago, Congress created the Office of the Advocate to scrutinize PBGC practices and be a liaison for plan sponsors. The Office of the Advocate has offered dozens of recommendations over the years to improve services and management. After a decade of watching recommendations go unnoticed, this year's annual report reiterated the need uh, for a change in leadership. The report recommends the creation of a CEO position to provide daily oversight and management of PBGC's senior leaders. This is something I believe Congress should take seriously as we look for legislative solutions following this hearing. We need to ensure that PBGC never needs a taxpayer bailout again. We need to ensure all government employees are showing up to work and providing excellent services to Americans. We need to ensure that those in leadership are committed to following the letter of the law we need to adjust premium rates to accurately reflect the risk associated with pension plans. I think your agency certainly has its work cut out for it, and this committee is certainly going to do its job and be watching this very closely. 
And so again, we thank you for your time. And without objection, there being no further business, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>